Cinderella. Once there was a rich man whose first wife died, leaving him with a small daughter. After some years, the man married again, but his second wife was as proud as she was mean and loved no one except her own two ugly daughters. These girls, in turn, were jealous of the man's first child, and soon made themselves the centre of the household, forcing the girl to become their servant. She had to scrub the floors and wash the dishes, shake out the heavy feather beds, and worst of all, get up before dawn each day to clean out the cinders in the hearth. The poor girl slept in an attic under the roof, on a sack full of straw. In winter time, when the snow blew through the tiles and covered the sack like an eider down, she would lay herself down near the ashes and cinders in the kitchen hearth in order to keep warm. For this reason, and because her clothes were always dusty with the ashes from the fire, the two sisters used to call her Cinderella. In fact, they were jealous of her. For no matter how hard Cinderella worked, nor how ragged her clothes were, she still looked far prettier than they. One day, the king's son gave a ball and invited all the fashionable people to it. Cinderella's stepmother and her daughters were invited along with the rest, and the ugly sisters set to work at once, ordering elaborate gowns. Petticoats and wigs for themselves. They made Cinderella starch the lace and pleat the frills, steam the velvet and iron the silk. I am going to wear a red velvet gown with French trimmings," said the elder. And the younger said, "I think that I should wear a gold-flowered blue bodice with my diamond stomacher, which is far from being the most ordinary one in the world." They sent for the best hairdresser they could get to make up their wigs, and the most fashionable dressmaker to sew their new robes. And they brought beauty patches from the smartest shop in the city to stick on their faces. While Cinderella helped them arrange their hair, they teased her about the ball. Wouldn't you like to go too? They asked. Oh, but of course you can't. Everyone there. Would laugh at the cinder dust on your dress. Anyone other than Cinderella would have done their hair badly and ruined it, but she was a good, kind person, and made them look as beautiful as she possibly could. On the day of the ball, the ugly sisters spent hours admiring themselves in the oval mirrors in their rooms. At last. The hour of the ball drew near, and they stepped into their coach and drove off to the palace in a cloud of red and blue flounces and frothy lace. Cinderella watched them until they were out of sight. Then she went back to her seat by the fire and cried her heart out from loneliness and sorrow. Suddenly, there was a tapping at the window. And a strange lady entered the kitchen. She had green eyes and a long cloak, and she carried a small wand in her hand. She asked Cinderella what was the matter. I wish, I wish I could. Cinderella was crying so hard that she could not finish her sentence. My dear, you wish you could go to the ball. Well, so you shall. A long time ago, when your mother was still alive, I became your fairy godmother. Now, be a good girl, my child, and run into the garden and bring me a large golden pumpkin. Cinderella hurried into the garden, and with the help of a lantern, chose the finest pumpkin there and brought it to her godmother. That lady took a little silver knife out of her pocket and scooped out the center of the pumpkin, leaving nothing but the rind. Then she struck it with a wand, and it instantly turned into a fine coach. The girl 
had seen carriages with the grand ladies driving through the steer when she was scrubbing the front steps. And she had wistfully seen her sisters riding haughtingly off the ball in the stylish coach. But she had never seen a coach like this, all covered in gold, the color of a pumpkin. Next, the godmother asked her to look in the mouse trap in the pantry. There she found six mice, all alive. The fairy told Cinderella to lift up the little trap door. And as each mouse scuttled out, she gave it a tap with her wand and turned it into a fine horse with a long flowing mane. In no time, they were harnessed to the coach and made a handsome team of six horses with beautiful mouse-colored gray coats. We still need a coachman, she said to Cinderella, who at once had an idea. There is a rat trap in the shed, she cried. I'll go and see if there is a rat in it that we could make into a coachman. So she brought in the trap and inside it they found a stout rat with splendid whiskers, whom the fairy turned into a fat jolly coachman with the smartest moustache you ever saw. After that she said to Cinderella, Go into the garden again, my dear, and you will find six lizards behind the watering can. Bring them to me. Cinderella had no sooner done so than the godmother turned them into six footmen in livery who skipped up behind the coach and hung into its traps as tightly as if they had done nothing else all their lives. Then the fairy turned to Cinderella and asked her if she was pleased. Oh yes, cried Cinderella. But how can I go to the ball, dressed in rags, like this? Her godmother touched her once with the van, and her clothes were turned into a gown of Indian muslin, edged with swans down and pearls, silver and white like a summer's night. On her head lay a crown of starry flowers, and on her hand she wore a ring of gold and precious stones. Finally, the fairy changed the wooden clocks on her feet into slippers of spun glass lined with swans down. As Cinderella was just about to drive off in her coach and six, her godmother called out, Remember to come back before midnight, dear. If you stay a moment longer, the coach will be a pumpkin again, the horses mice, the coachman a rat, the footmen lizards, and your clothes as ragged as before. Cinderella promised to leave the ball before twelve, and then away she drove, trembling with joy. When they saw her step out of the coach, the prince and all the court were struck dumb with admiration. The lords and ladies left off dancing and the violinist stopped playing, the better to admire Cinderella's beauty. Then, as the prince asked her to be his partner, the violinists took up their bows again and the music sounded more sweetly than ever before. The king, the queen and everyone present praised Cinderella's beauty and her graceful dancing and wondered who she could be. The prince never left her side, and the two of them danced and talked until they felt they had known each other all their lives. So lost were they in each other that Cinderella quite lost track of the time. As the clock began striking midnight, she started up and fled through the palace like a deer. The prince hurried after her, but he could not catch her. As she ran down the great staircase, one of her glass slippers came off and the prince picked it up and put it in his pocket. The guards at the palace gate were asked if they had not seen a princess go out. They had seen nobody, they said, save for a young girl in rags who looked like a kitchen maid. When the ugly sisters returned from the ball, they told Cinderella, that the prince had quite lost his heart to the mysterious princess who had vanished 
so suddenly and that he had done nothing but gaze at her little glass slipper for the remainder of the evening. The prince ordered that the slipper should be laid on a silk cushion and carried in state through the city. While his heralds read a proclamation that he would marry the girl whose foot the slipper fitted. It was to be tried on every unmarried lady, beginning at the top with the princess and the duchess. The turn came for the ugly sisters to open their door to the royal messenger. The slipper was brought to the elder sister to try on. But push as she might, her foot was too big. So greedy was she to become a princess that she actually snipped off her big toe with a pair of scissors and managed to squeeze her foot into the slipper. But the royal messenger saw the blood through the glass and disqualified her. Then the second sister tried on the slipper. But this time it was her heel that was too big. So she pared it down with a kitchen knife until the shoe fitted. However, she limped so badly that the messenger discovered her trick and disqualified her too. Then Cinderella laughed and said, Please let me try on the slipper. Despite her sister's protests, the messenger kneeled down and slipped it on her foot. It fitted her as if it had been made of wax. Then Cinderella pulled out the other slipper from her pocket and put it on her other foot. The fairy godmother appeared at the moment and changed Cinderella's clothes into robes that were more magnificent than any she had worn before. Then her two sisters recognized her as the beautiful lady at the ball and they threw themselves at her feet and begged her pardon for the ill treatment of her. Cinderella kissed them and said she would forgive them gladly if they behaved to her like a sister. They both promised they would from now on. She was brought to the prince who thought her more charming than ever and a few days later they were married. Cinderella who was as good as she was beautiful found husbands for her sisters too who were wealthy and kinder than they had any right to expect. And then Cinderella and her prince lived happily ever after. Rumpelstiltskin There was once a miller who was poorer than most but he had a beautiful daughter. The girl was the apple of his eye and her father boasted that she was lovely enough to be a queen. One day, the king rode by. He noticed the girl by the stream washing linen. How beautiful she is! The king thought to himself. Aloud he said, What is your name? Before the girl could answer, her father replied, <laughs> If you please, sire, that is my daughter. A finer girl you'll never see. <laughs> the king looked down at them both with interest from his beautiful dappled grey horse. Indeed, she has a lovely face, he replied. The miller's heart swelled with pride. <laughs> To be sure, to be sure, <laughs> but, but, but there is more to her than her face, <laughs> he said. What do you mean, Miller? The king asked curiously. Uh, well, well, uh, she can, uh, I mean, I mean, she can. Uh, the uh, miller tried desperately to think of something that would impress the king. His eyes met the king's and he looked down at his feet. He watched the chickens scratch around in the yellow straw looking for grain. <laughs> I think she can spin the straw into gold. <laughs> he exclaimed with a look of immense triumph. But father, his daughter broke in, dismayed at these untrue words. A rare girl indeed. The king said and smiled. 
If your fingers can really turn straw into gold, then your place is in my castle. Come with me and I'll see if it is true. The girl had no choice but to obey her king and together they rode to his castle. When they arrived there, he led her to a high dark room that was filled with straw. A spinning wheel stood in the center. The king said, You have until sunrise to spin this dry straw into gold. But if you do not, and if your father has lied to me, then you must surely die. The girl heard the bolts being drawn across the door, and she was so terrified that she started to cry. Then she noticed a little man standing in front of her. What is the matter? He asked. I'm so unhappy, wept the girl. The king has asked me to spin all this straw into gold by the morning, and I haven't a notion how to do it. What will you give me if I do it for you? The little man asked. The locket around my neck, she replied. The little man took the locket, sat himself down at the wheel, and in no time at all, the bales of straw were spun into a pile of bobbins full of rich gold thread. As soon as the sun rose, the king came, unbolted the door, and was delighted to see so much gold around him. But his privy purse was still not nearly full, and he needed a lot more gold to pay the soldiers who guarded his land from the greedy neighbors. He took the miller's daughter into a much larger room and told her to spin all the straw into gold by the next morning. That night, the girl began to cry again, for she knew her task was hopeless. But again, the little man appeared and again he said, What will you give me if I spin the straw into gold for you? The belt around my waist, she said. The little man took the belt and whirl, round went the spinning wheel again and bobbin after bobbin was filled with fine gold thread until there was no straw left. The king was pleased beyond measure at the sight. He knew that with just a little more gold in his treasury, he could really get the country going again. So he filled his largest room with straw and let the girl into it. If you can spin all this away during the night, he said, I'll take you as my wife, and then you need never spin straw again. When the girl was alone, the little man appeared for the third time and said, What will you give me if I spin the straw for you again? I have nothing left to give you, she replied. Then promise me you will give me your firstborn child when you are the queen, said the little man. The girl thought that a lot of things could happen before that. So she promised him whatever he demanded. When the king came in the next morning, he found heaps of gold where the straw had been. Oh, miller's daughter, you have spun more gold for me in three nights than I could hope to find in three score years. Your skill is only matched by your great beauty. Will you be my queen? So the girl, who already loved him dearly, became his wife, and in time she gave birth to their son. She had quite forgotten her promise to the little man, until one day he stepped into the room and said, Now give me what you promised. The queen was dismayed and begged him to take all her jewels and riches instead. He refused, but then he said, Since you cry so bitterly at the loss of your baby, I will give you one more chance to save him. You may have three days in which to guess my name, and if you do, then you may keep him. The queen stayed awake all night trying to remember all the names she had ever heard. When the little man arrived the following day, she began with Nicholas, Timothy, Herward and all the other names she knew. But after each name, he called out, 
No, that's not my name. The next day, she read all the books in the royal library and memorized all the uncommon names in them. She asked, Is your name Nimrod or Noah or Marmaduke? But he always replied calmly, That's not my name. The third day, she sent messengers all over the country to learn what names people were calling their children. At length, one messenger came back and said, Your Majesty, I have not been able to find any new names, but on a high hill where the foxes and hares bid each other good night, I saw a little man dancing around the fire and singing, Oh, little things, my royal dame. Oh, little things, my royal dame. That rumple still skin, rumple still skin, rumple still skin is my name. Imagine the queen's delight when she heard that name. But when the little man arrived that night, she asked first, Is your name Roger? No. Is your name Robert? Ha <laughs> ha. No, no, no. Is it perhaps... Still skin. The devil it is, the devil it is. He screamed and stamped his foot into the ground with such fury that he split into two. The Sleeping Beauty Once upon a time, there was a king and a queen who were very unhappy because they had no children. They had been married a long time and had almost given up hope. At last, the dearest wish came true with the birth of a most beautiful baby girl. Their joy was so great that no cost was spared in the preparations for the splendid christening, to which the king and the queen invited all the fairies in the kingdom. All that is except one. There were thirteen fairies in the domain. But actually, only twelve had been invited because no one knew exactly where the thirteenth was to be found. Nobody liked her very much anyway. She was always inclined to be crotchety and quarrelsome and was always picking up the other fairies, probably because they were all younger and prettier than she was. After the christening ceremony, the thirteenth fairy appeared in a rush of rage at having been overlooked. Fearing some mischief was brewing, the youngest fairy hid herself behind the tapestry hangings so that she would be the last to announce her gifts and could undo whatever harm the old fairy was plotting. Then the fairies began to make their gifts to the little princess. The first gave her beauty, the second goodness, the third gracefulness, the fourth made her a perfect dancer. The fifth gave her a lovely singing voice and the sixth the skill to play every musical instrument in the world perfectly. In short, they gave her everything one could wish for in life. Then came the old fairy's turn. Angrily she stepped up to the prince's cradle and cried out with jealous bite. When you're fifteen, you will prick your finger with a spindle and fall lifeless to the ground. Then she turned around and left the hall. At this terrible curse, everyone trembled and began to weep. But at that instant, the youngest fairy stepped out of her hiding place. Take heart, your daughter shall not die. It's true that I have not the power to undo the envious fairy spell completely. The princess will indeed prick her finger with a spindle when she is fifteen. But instead of dying, she will only fall into a deep sleep that will last a hundred years. And when that time has passed, a king's son will come and waken her. The king, hoping to save his daughter from the old fairy spell, immediately ordered that every spindle and every spinning wheel in the country should be burned. All the good wishes of the first fairies came true. The princess grew into a young girl of such beauty, goodness and grace as had never been seen before. She had just become fifteen when one afternoon she was playing a game of hide and seek with the other boys and girls in the castle. It was her turn to hide and she ran into the forest end of the courtyard. 
where there were several doors that led into a cluster of towers which had been shut up for many years. At length, she reached a little room at the top and there she found an old woman sitting at a spinning wheel. With the wheel whirring round and the flax twirling on the spindle. What are you doing? <laughs> I am spinning. The old woman, who obviously had not heard of the king's order that every spinning wheel in the land should be destroyed and did not know who her visitor was. Sometimes I spin flax into linen. Sometimes I spin a ship's fleece into wool. Sometimes I even spin gold into the thread for fine ladies to sew with. Oh, is it difficult? Yes, at first it is. Uh, uh, let me try, please. Yes, you can. The princess begged and the old woman handed her the spindle and the thread. No sooner had she taken the spindle than its point pricked her hand and she immediately fell to the ground in a swoon. The curse of the wicked old fairy had come true. The old woman, terrified, cried out for help and people came running from all parts of the castle. They tried to bring the princess round by throwing water on her face, loosening her gown and holding smelling salts under her nose. But nothing worked. Realizing that the spell had begun and must run its course, the king ordered his daughter to be carried to her bedchamber and laid on a bedspread embroidered with gold and silver to sleep in peace until the appointed hundred years had passed. The fairy who had saved the princess's life came to know about the princess and left immediately in a chariot of fire drawn by six dragons and arrived at the king's palace in less than an hour. As she walked through the palace, she brushed every living thing in it with a wand except the king and queen. As she touched them, they fell asleep. Ministers, governesses, clerks, maids of honor, soldiers, cowherds, footmen, pages all fell asleep. Outside in the courtyard, the wind stopped blowing and in the gardens, the flowers closed their petals and prepared for the long night. Then the king and queen kissed their beloved daughter and sadly left the castle forever. Within a quarter of an hour, a forest of trees and creepers had grown up around its walls so thickly intertwined that no one could pass through them and disturb the princess as she slept. The topmost turrets of the castle could barely be seen above the mass of greenery. The fairy had done her work quickly and well. Ninety-nine summers and ninety-nine winters had passed when one fine day the son of the reigning king was hunting in the forest. He caught sight of the distant turrets and asked his men what they were. Some told him that they believed it was a ruin haunted by spirits. An old peasant stepped forward and said, May it please your highness, more than fifty years ago, I heard my father say that his grandfather had told him there was a castle in this forest in which the most beautiful princess ever born was lying asleep. She was under a spell, and it is said that she could only be awakened by a king's son. The prince's heart was set on fire by these words. Impatient to discover the truth for himself, he drew his sword and advanced towards the creepers. The metal flashed in the sunlight as he struck it into the deepest knot of thorns. To his surprise, it gave way easily. He had only to touch the branches for them to fall apart and allow a passage large enough to let him and his horse through. What surprised him even more was that as soon as he had passed through the briars, they closed again behind him, cutting the followers off. Alone he advanced through the first courtyard which was filled with horses and men whom at first he thought were dead. Then he realized that they were all asleep and breathing peacefully. Finally he came to a room where the pale light filtered onto a bedecked bed on which lay a sleeping girl 
more ravishing than any he had ever beheld. Trembling, the prince approached the bed and fell on his knees beside it, gazing at the princess. The fingers of her hand rested lightly on a puppy curled up sleeping in the crook of her arm. A faint smile played about her lips as if a sweet dream contented her as she slept. At last, the prince bent over the princess and kissed her gently on the forehead. And now, the curse was at an end. At the touch of his lips, the princess awoke. I have waited for you so long, she said, smiling at the prince. Together they walked through the castle and wherever they went, the people woke up around them. All the court woke and everyone set about their duties again. The prince and the princess went into a great hall where a delicious supper was served to them. The prince and the princess, who were falling more deeply in love with every minute that passed, were married as soon as supper was over. And then the merriment and rejoicing, the feasting and music making began all over again. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs Once upon a time, a queen sat sewing by her window. The snow was falling outside and she watched the flakes settle on her black ebony windowsill. As she sewed, she pricked her finger with the needle and a drop of red blood fell onto the snow. She thought to herself, I wish I had a daughter with skin as white as the snow, with lips as red as this blood, with hair as black as this ebony. By and by her wish came true and she gave birth to a baby girl whom she called Snow White. But the queen died when her baby was born and not long afterwards the king married again. The new queen was very beautiful but she was an evil woman and could not bear the idea that anyone might be lovelier than she. A magic mirror hung in her room and each day she would look in it and ask, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? And the mirror would reply, You, O queen, are fairer than all. The years went by and each day Snow White grew more beautiful until one morning when the queen looked yet again into her mirror and asked, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? You are fair, O Queen, is true, but Snow White is fairer far than you. The Queen was beside herself with hatred and jealousy and resolved to get rid of her stepdaughter at once. She sent for a huntsman and ordered him to take the girl deep into the forest and kill her and bring back her heart as proof that she was dead. The huntsman rode with Snow White into the deepest part of the forest, but when he took out his knife to kill her, he was so touched by the girl's beauty and gentleness that he could not plunge its blade through her heart. I cannot kill you myself, but I cannot take you back to the palace, and I fear the wild beasts of the forest will soon eat you up. He left Snow White in the forest, and on his way back, he killed a deer instead and gave its heart to the queen who believed that it was Snow White's. Poor Snow White, meanwhile, was wandering in the dark forest, terrified. The wild beasts watched her as she stumbled through the trees, but they did not touch her. At nightfall, she came to a clearing in the wood where there was a little house. She tapped on the shutters, but no one answered. She tapped on the door and then opened it and went inside. She found herself in a low room with a wooden table and benches stretching the length of it. On the table were seven bowls, seven spoons and seven cups. For this was the home of the seven dwarfs who worked in the mountains digging for gold. Snow White was so hungry that she sat down and ate a little of the pudding in each bowl and sipped some milk from each cup. Then she went upstairs where there was a room just large enough to hold seven small beds. 
she slipped into one of them and was soon fast asleep. As the moon came up in the sky, the seven dwarfs returned. Each carried his shovel and pickaxe on his back and his bag of gold tied to his waist with a leather strap. As soon as they set their lanterns on the table, they saw someone had been in their house. been eating our food. Yes, yes. Who has been eating our food? They cried. <laughs> then they climbed upstairs to the bedroom and found Snow White fast asleep on a bed. And tell me, who is this beautiful child? I wonder, who is it? They asked each other in delight and amazement. Then Snow White awoke and told them her story and the dwarfs felt so sorry for her that they invited her to stay with them and be their housekeeper. They warned her that she must never open the door to anyone while they were away digging in the mountains, for they feared that the wicked queen would find out she was alive and try to kill her. So Snow White stayed with the dwarfs and made their beds and swept their rooms and cooked supper for them. She was very happy with the dwarves, and before long, she had forgotten all about her wicked stepmother. But one day, however, the queen again asked her magic mirror, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? You are fair, O queen, it's true, but Snow White is fairer far than you. Deep within the forest glade, she her home with dwarfs has made. The queen's face turned black with rage at these words. Realizing the huntsman had tricked her, she resolved to kill Snow White with her own hands. She disguised herself as a peddler woman and made her way to the dwarf's house in the forest. Snow White was sitting by the window, patching a jacket belonging to one of the dwarfs. The queen called out, to her in a rough countrywoman's voice, Buy my buttons, ribbons and lace, each one will suit your face. Delighted at the chance of buying something pretty, Snow White quite forgot the dwarf's warning. She ran to open the door. The laces on your bodies are loose, my dear, said the disguised queen. Let me tie them up for you. And with that, she laced Snow White up so swiftly and so tightly that the girl could not breathe and fell to the ground as if she were dead. Laughing, the wicked queen hurried back to her palace, feeling certain she had got rid of Snow White for good. When the dwarfs came home that night, they found Snow White lying in the doorway. As soon as they lifted her up, they could see what had happened. They cut the laces on her bodice with a knife and at once the air rushed back into Snow White's lungs and she began breathing again. She told them what had happened and the dwarfs realized that the peddler woman was the wicked queen in disguise still determined to kill her. Never open the door to anyone again. They begged her and Snow White promised she would not. That night, the queen went to her mirror again. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? You are fair, O queen, it's true, but Snow White is fairer far than you. At this, the enraged queen rushed to her cellar in the castle where she kept her secret potions. There, she made a poisoned apple. One side was bright red and the other green. The green side could safely be eaten, but one bite of the red side would kill in a second. Yet again, the queen disguised herself. This time, she dressed as a country woman in ragged clothes with a basket of apples over her arm. On top of the pile, she placed the beautifully colored poisoned apple. She arrived at the dwarf's house just as Snow White was drawing water from the well. But as soon as the girl saw her coming, she grew frightened and ran indoors, bolting the door behind her. Then she heard the voice of the countrywoman calling, Apples! Fresh and sweet apples! 
and she longed to test them. If she opened the window and kept the door shut, there could be no danger. So she opened the shutter and leaned out. Let me see your apples, she called down. Taste this one, my pretty. It is one of the best, replied the queen, holding up the poisoned apple. Then, as the girl hesitated a bit, she went on. Don't be afraid to eat it. See, I'll cut it into two halves, one for you and one for me. She began to eat the green half and threw the red one up to Snow White, who could not resist taking a bite. But she had no sooner put the apple into her mouth than she fell to the ground dead. That night, the queen polished and stroked the mirror as she asked, Mirror, mirror in my hand, who is the fairest in the land? Queen of beauty, you are she. None can now your rival be. When the dwarfs came home and found Snow White dead, Beyond reviving, they built a glass coffin which they set among flowers nearby so they could watch over her day and night. One day, a young prince came riding by with his huntsmen. Seeing the glass coffin, he dismounted from his horse, curious for a look at the girl inside. She seemed to be in a deep sleep for her skin was still as white as snow, her lips as red as blood, and her hair as black as ebony. Her beauty enchanted him. He begged the dwarfs, Oh, please let me carry the coffin away with me. I will give you greater riches than you can ever hope to dig out of these mountains. No, no. She is worth more to us than all the gold in the world. But at last, when they saw that the prince had fallen in love with their dear Snow White, they took pity on him and gave him the coffin as a present. The prince told his huntsmen to carry the glass case carefully to his palace. But as they were lifting it up, one of them stumbled over a root, and the jarring made the piece of apple fall from between Snow White's lips. She awoke and sat up, looking about her in amazement. The prince told her everything that had happened and then asked her to become his wife. And Snow White, who had loved him the moment she set eyes on him, happily agreed. A great feast was held in honor of their marriage and one of the guests invited was the wicked queen. As she wrote herself for the banquet, she asked the mirror, Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of us all? Fairer than you was rarely seen, but Snow White too is now a queen. Your fairness then is nothing worth. Now Snow White's radiance fills the earth. When she heard this, the queen smashed the mirror in pieces to the ground. And she was so filled with a jealous rage that her heart burst and she fell down dead. But Snow White and her prince lived happily ever after. Aladdin and his Lamp Many, many years ago, a boy called Aladdin, who lived with his widowed mother, in a city in China. Aladdin's mother used to spin cotton on a wheel. By working from sunrise to sunset, she could earn just enough money to buy bread and goat's milk to keep herself and Aladdin alive. The boy played in the streets all day, for nobody cared enough about him to teach him a trade, nor even how to spell his name. He was always hungry and dirty, and his only friends were beggars and thieves. He dreamed that one day a magician would come along and make him the richest and the most handsome man in the land. When Aladdin was 15 years old, he was coming out of his house one day when a stranger who was walking by stopped and looked at him. He was an 
evil magician from Africa, who had been watching Aladdin secretly for quite a while. He needed a boy to help him with the plan he had made, a boy whom nobody would miss if he ever returned. <laughs> Aren't you Mustafa's son? <laughs> yes, sir, I am. But my father has been dead for many years. He was a poor tailor, and since he died, we have become poorer still. My child, I am your uncle. I have been traveling abroad for many, many years, but now I have come back to look after you and your mother. You need never go hungry again. He pressed some gold pieces into the boy's hand and told him to buy wine and food so that they could celebrate his homecoming. The magician promised Aladdin's mother that he would set her son up in a shop of his own. He bought Aladdin fine new clothes and invited him to come and see the sights of the city with him. They visited the shops of the richest merchants and admired the Sultan's great palace. Finally, when the sun had climbed high in the sky and they were hot and tired from their sightseeing, the magician led Aladdin into a cool, shady garden full of flowers. The magician led Aladdin up to the big stone and told him to collect enough sticks to make a fire. Then he set the sticks alight and threw a few drops of oil on the flames. A thick, dense smoke immediately curled up like a snake around them. The magician chanted strange words and suddenly a bronze ring appeared in the stone. Aladdin, you are the only person in the world who can collect the treasure that lies beneath the stone. Raise it and go down the steps you will see into a cave. This will lead you to a garden which is filled with treasures beyond human imagination. Collect what you like there and I want you to bring me is the lamp you will find burning on the garden terrace. Take this ring. Take this ring, my son. Put it on your finger and it will keep you from harm. Aladdin lifted the stone by the bronze ring and climbed down into the cave. The boy's gaze rested on the trees laden with pearls, emeralds and rubies. More perfect than anything in the world. He had never seen jewels before and thought they were just colored glass. But they were beautiful, so he picked up as many of them as he could. Then he found the lamp and put it carefully in his shirt before hurrying back to the cave entrance where the magician was waiting impatiently. Aladdin, give me the lamp first and I'll help you out. No, I will give it to you only when I come out. Help me up first. They argued like this for a long time until the magician flew into a fury, slammed the stone down over the entrance and disappeared. Aladdin had been so excited that he had forgotten to be afraid. Now locked underground in the darkness, he was terrified and clasped his hands together in prayer. In doing this, he accidentally rubbed the ring the magician had given him. Immediately, a huge genie appeared before him. It was so big that it seemed to fill the entire cave. <laughs> I am the slave of the ring. What can I do for you, master? I want to go home. And immediately found himself standing in front of his mother. They hugged each other, weeping for joy, while Aladdin told her his adventures. Then realizing how hungry he was, he asked for some food. His mother began to weep again because she had none in the house and no money to buy anything. Mother, we can sell the lamp I found in the cave. And his mother fetched some water and sand to rub it clean. No sooner she had begun rubbing it, another genie appeared, even larger and fiercer than the slave of the ring. <laughs> <laughs> what do you command, master? Um, some food, please. The genie reappeared and instant later, 
carrying silver dishes laden with meat and fruit and silver cups filled with wine. Then it disappeared while Aladdin took care of his mother who had fainted at the first moment she caught the sight of the genie. The food and wine lasted them for two days. Then Aladdin took the dishes to the market and sold them for so much money that they had plenty to eat for the rest of that year. For several years, they went on living like this, spending their money carefully and using the genie of the lamp only when they really needed help. Aladdin had grown into a handsome young man and he spent his time wisely learning from the merchants of the city. One day, he happened to see the Sultan's daughter being carried through the streets on a little born by slaves. She was so beautiful that he instantly fell in love with her and wanted her for his wife. He brought out the jewels he had gathered from the trees in the magic garden, whose true value he did not know, and asked his mother to carry them to Sultan and ask for his daughter hand in marriage. When the Sultan saw the superb jewels, his interest in the unknown suitor was great. Hmm. Tell your son to bring me 40 times the gold and jewels he has given me here and I will give him my daughter's hand in marriage. Overjoyed, the woman hurried home to tell her son the good news from the palace. Aladdin commanded the genie to bring him the presents and in an instant there appeared 40 black slaves and 40 white slaves, each one carrying a basin of gold filled with pearls, diamonds, rubies and emeralds. For Aladdin, there was a robe that was more splendid than any of the king's clothes he had ever been. And a magnificent horse with a harness studded with jewels. As he rode through the streets to the palace, his slaves threw pieces of gold to the people who cheered this handsome and generous young prince until their voices grew hoarse. The Sultan was so impressed by Aladdin's splendor that he summoned the Grand Judge of the city and commanded him to draw up the marriage contract at once. Then Aladdin went home and rubbed his lamp once more. <laughs> what is your command, Master? I command you, build me a palace tonight, opposite that of the Sultan. It must be worthy to receive my bride. Go now and only return when everything is completed as I have commanded. The next morning, the Sultan was amazed to see a new palace opposite his own, richer and more beautiful than anything that had ever been seen before. The wedding was celebrated at once. The years passed and Aladdin and his princess lived together most happily. Then one day, while Aladdin was out hunting with his men, the African magician returned. He had heard of Aladdin's wealth and knew it could only have come through the magic of the lamp. Determined to get the lamp for himself, he disguised himself as a peddler and walked up and down the street beneath the princess's window, carrying a tray of brightly polished brass lamps. New lamps for old! New lamps for old! He cried, and to each of the servants from the palace, who brought him a tarnished old lamp, he gave a shiny new one. At length, the princess heard him and remembered the old lamp Aladdin had kept in his room. She sent one of her slaves to exchange it for a new one, knowing nothing about this of the magic bars, until it was too late and the magician had made the genie of the lamp transport the princess and her entire palace and all its inhabitants to his home in Africa. On his return that evening, Aladdin was dismayed to find that both the princess and the palace had vanished. The Sultan immediately had him arrested and brought before the executioner. In despair, Aladdin pressed his hands together to say his last prayer. But he had forgotten that he still wore the magic ring and when he now accidentally rubbed it, a genie reappeared. <laughs> what do you wish, master? Take me to where my princess is hidden. 
The words were hardly out of his mouth when he found himself in Africa, face to face with his beloved again. The princess told Aladdin everything that had happened and how the magician was trying to win her love. Aladdin gave her a deadly poison which he told her to pour into the magician's cup when he came to visit her. Then he hid himself close by. As the moon rose that evening, the magician made his way to the princess's chamber. But instead of greeting him with tears as before, the princess welcomed him inside. She beckoned to him to sit beside her and then she offered him the cup of wine. The magician accepted it eagerly, drained it to the last drop and fell lifeless to the ground. Aladdin hurried from his hiding place and removed the lamp from his body. The moment he rubbed it, the genie of the lamp appeared and with its help, the palace and everyone in it was transported home again. Aladdin at once took the princess to her father and the three embraced with tears of delight and lived happily ever after. Rapunzel Once upon a time, a man and his wife lived in a small house which lay close to a splendid garden that belonged to a witch. From their windows, they could see rare herbs and flowers growing in the garden, but they never dared to pick any, for they knew that if they did, they would fall into the witch's power. One day, however, the wife fell ill with a fever and it seemed certain that she would die. In her sickness, she longed for one thing only, the leaves of a herb called Rampion, which grew in the witch's garden. Her husband, who loved her dearly, was ready to risk anything to save his wife and so, at dusk, he climbed over the witch's garden wall. He picked some of the leaves and returned safely with them to his wife who ate them and recovered her strength. It was not long, however, before she fell ill again. And this time, it was the root of the herb she wanted. At dusk, the husband again climbed over the wall and tried to pull the herb by its roots. Suddenly, he felt a burning pain in his hands and looked up. He saw the witch standing in front of him. A curse on you! for stealing the rampion from my garden. But, but my wife is ill and will die without your herb, pleaded the man. But the witch had no mercy. Go, but in exchange for the rampion you have stolen, I shall take your firstborn child. I shall come and collect it on the day it is born, remember. Not long afterwards, a daughter was born to the couple and no sooner had she opened her eyes to the world than the witch appeared to claim her as she had declared she would. In their rejoicing at the birth of the child they had so ardently awaited, the couple had pushed to the back of their minds the harsh demand the witch had made of the husband and they begged her now to let them keep their small daughter. But neither tears nor entreaty had any effect on the merciless witch who picked up the child and carried her ruthlessly away. From the start, she called her Rapunzel, which is another name for Rampion. Years passed and Rapunzel grew up to be the loveliest creature in the world. When she was twelve, the witch locked her into a tower in the depth of a forest surrounded by mountains. The tower had neither stairs nor door, and the only way into it was through Rapunzel's window, high up in the wall. When the witch wanted to visit her, she would call up, Rapunzel! Rapunzel! Let down your hair! The girl had wonderfully long golden hair, which she would twist into a thick plate and wind around the window bar so that it dropped clear down to the ground and the witch could use it as a rope to climb up. A prince, who had lost his way in the forest, came riding past the tower one evening. As it drew near, he heard the loveliest voice he had ever heard singing and he stopped to listen. It was Rapunzel. Then he heard the witch's voice call up, Rapunzel! Rapunzel! 
Lay down your hair. He saw thick coils of golden hair let down from the tiny window. The witch climbed up and disappeared from view. The prince was determined to see the girl who sang so sweetly. So he waited until the witch had gone, and then he called up, "Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let your hair down!" At once, the golden rope swung down the tower wall to him, and he climbed up it. As soon as he saw Rapunzel's beauty, he fell in love with her, and he asked her to become his wife. Rapunzel, who had never seen anyone but the old witch, was delighted by this handsome young man and agreed to escape with him. She said, "Every time you come to see me, you must bring a skein of silk, and I will plait it into a ladder as thick as my hair, and then we can climb down and ride away together." The prince came to see her every evening because the witch visited her during the daytime. The day of their escape was drawing near when Rapunzel, who could think of nothing but her prince, said dreamily to the witch, "Why is it, good dame, that you are so much heavier to pull up than my prince?" Thus the witch learned that Rapunzel had deceived her, and she flew into a rage. She cut off Rapunzel's long hair and tied it to the window bars. Then she carried the girl to a distant valley and left her there alone to live in misery. That evening, the prince came and called to his beloved as usual. Her hair came tumbling down to him, and he climbed up into the tower. But this time, it was the witch who pulled him in, cursing him as she did so. She is gone. You will never see her again. With that. She threw the young man out of the window into the forest below. He fell into the thicket of briars, and the thorns crashed his eyes and blinded him. He wandered blind and sad through the forest and over the mountains, weeping for his beloved. One day, at last, he came to the valley where Rapunzel was living. As soon as she saw him, she ran to him, weeping, and her tears fell on his eyes and healed them. So that he could see again as well as ever. Then the prince took Rapunzel to his kingdom, where they married and lived the rest of their lives in complete happiness.